All right, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan Bernyard. I'm Vice President of Sales at Virtue Size, and uh, this uh, session today is a follow-up to our earlier um, informal conversation that we had uh, about a month, well, a little more than a month ago, about the Geo Convention 2020 and what does a virtual convention look like. And uh, here we are approximately a month later, a little less than a month later, now that the, the, the convention is behind us. And what did it look like? And what, what's the feedback? So I've, um, a group, we've got a group here that uh, we're all attending, uh, plus representation from the GEO convention itself. So how about we go around the table and do some introductions and I'll start off with you, Kirk. Great, thanks again for, for having me and inviting me. I'm Kirk Graham. I'm a business development executive with SoundQI Solutions here in Calgary. And this was my first fully virtual conference and SoundQIs as well. And we had that exhibitor experience. Excellent. Denise? Uh, good morning. Thank you uh, for having me as well, Jonathan. I'm Denise Freeland, a long-term tech, uh, geoscience tech and data manager in the oil and gas industry here in Calgary. And I am the president of the Calgary Geoscience Data Managers Society. Excellent. Thank you. And last but by no means least, Dustin. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, Dustin Menger. I am the director of GeoConvention. And much like Kirk, this was my first virtual event as well. Excellent. All right. Well, um, I must admit, per for me personally, I really enjoyed the convention. Uh, I thought it was excellent. Um, my thoughts are that, you know, this is the new reality, <laughs> along with many other things in our lives right now. And um, I, I could see, you know, us moving forward with a hybrid version um, uh, going forward. And, and I think it opens up a whole world of, of new opportunities uh, as to how we do things differently, much as we are doing in our work lives with you know, working at home or partially working in the office at home and uh, doing things differently and actually you know, learning to do things in a new way that, and we find ourselves even more productive maybe than we were before. So I think that's somewhat of a metaphor for, for this, but um, I know this group has a number of questions for you, Dustin. So why don't you kick us off, Kirk? I know you've got some good points that you wanted to bring up and share with us your experience. So um, yeah, well, let's, uh, let's look into the dark, <laughs> dark deep recesses of your mind. Well, uh, the uh, experience was fantastic. So I'll, I'll start out by saying Geocometric, great job, Dustin and team. And I kind of want to pitch it back to how did you maintain such high level of great technical content? That is the backbone of any of these experiences. The only reason anyone shows up, they don't, I, I would love to think that they show up to come and visit me at the booth. <laughs> but I think we know that they come to change their their current way of thinking, to find something new. And right now, everyone is looking for that, not just a five yard play to pull out a CFL analogy, but they're looking for that full field touchdown pass. So how were you able to keep people from, I've been to other virtual conferences, papers are being retracted all the time based on their ability to present, but somehow mm -hmm. you were able to create a safe environment where it seemed like there was more content than ever before and of a good caliber. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, our virtual geo convention 2020 uh, hosted about 600 total technical papers in, in one form or another oral or poster presentation. And that was up from our 2019 tally of just over 300. Uh, so a significant step up in the, the quantity of, of content. A big part of that, or a good chunk of it anyway, was from the, the once every decade collaboration with uh, GAC, MAC, and IAH CNC. Um, so every 10 years, we bring them in uh, to the Geo Convention uh, platform, and, and they have their content hosted with us as well. So that was a good part of it. Um, but other than that, the, the retention of the of the technical talks is largely due to the quality of our session chairs. Uh, they were very active in, in communicating with their presenters and ensuring that everyone was, was comfortable with what was going on, uh, as well as just the tools I think that we put in place to hopefully allow our presenters an easy opportunity to, to record themselves. We gave them the, the tools, the scripts, the step-by-step the -step instructions to make it all happen. Um, and try to make that process as simple as possible because you get too complex and people will kind of tap out, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll hold off a year, they'll do it next year. Uh, so we tried to make it just as simple as possible, a lot of direct communication, 
Uh, we were very, very active. Uh, yeah, just ensuring that everyone had a had a positive, you know, experience with with the recording of their content. Um, we also offered um, our presenters the opportunity to to have it just play once their presentation just go once right during their their allotted time slot. Uh, or they could have it on demand. So I think that gives some of our presenters some confidence that their presentation wouldn't be out there forever. Uh, it's it just hosted that once and then it's deleted uh, from the system. Uh, so I think for those that didn't want their content on demand, it was a good option for them. Yeah, you touched on that, uh, the session chairs, and that was great. I uh, spent some time in the uh, carbon storage sequestration group uh, and Halliday was running that <clears throat> really well organized, great questions because everything changed. It used to be when I was hosting things, you'd say, well, it's the five second rule. You ask a question and it takes five seconds for somebody to think, should I answer it? How am I gonna start my question and then start speaking? Yeah. Well, now you have to type out the whole question and hit send yeah. and you might even go back and edit it. So <laughs> when you ask, are there any questions for the speaker? That rule, I don't know what it is anymore. But by then yeah. uh, you're kind of coaxing some of that content, additional content from the speaker um, grabbing and clearly articulating the question to the speaker for them from the audience thought they did a great job in that section and it was neat to see there were a variety of approaches across the uh, different streams and uh, I felt felt that that was a, again an example of a stream that did it exceptionally well yeah we're, yeah. Gonna, have, we're gonna have to get a hold of the uh, the uh, jeopardy sound uh, when you're waiting for the question right <laughs> Right. So, yeah. so that, you know, that raises, uh, that raises another um, thought that, um, and that is, you know, the, the talks were fantastic. Um, and I'm wondering, I'd, I'd like to table the idea of, of, at least for discussion in this coming year, of a potential sort of um, adjacent hall, let's say, for all of the exhibitors to have stru structured talks without, throughout the day that could be, that could be recorded, you know, and I think you and I, you, uh, Kirk, you and I have discussed this slightly where, you know, you had times for your talks, but it can be difficult to sort of manage it sometimes and have people come to your booth. I was in, I was in the uh, PPDM um, forum a, a little while back and they had a virtual um, hall and uh, structured talks and there was a moderator. And I think that, that could be quite appealing to many of the exhibitors as to, okay, I wanna go see that talk from this group and so on and so forth. I'd mm -hmm. have to agree with that, Jonathan. Yeah. That, that would be very helpful. Like an adjacent- and As a vendor, I wanna be very respectful of the conference and not yeah. steal eyeballs away from other valid learning opportunities. Yeah, so yeah that's right. I right. do a convention on that it might help tighten the ship up for, to amplify the value I think so. And you know, from, from a vendor's perspective, I know I would, I would preserve the recording and share it within my network and use it as marketing collateral and uh, share it on LinkedIn, YouTube, you know, all those things that, you know, we do as vendors. And uh, I think it would be really useful, really useful, uh, but it's worth, worth discussing. I'd, I'd, you know, it may be extraordinarily complex or difficult to administer, but I think it's worth discussing. Um, uh, Denise, I know you had a couple of questions also. I did. First of all, I'd like to say how much I enjoyed the conference. It was very well done. I was very impressed. Um, I got certainly a lot out of it. And one of the things that I feel really helps is that we have some on-demand talks until the end of October. Mm -hmm. So for those of us who had multiple talks we wanted to see, now we can go back and see those. Yeah, so absolutely. good job. That was awesome. Uh, I think uh, my question, it was probably a little bit more about the the social aspect of it. Um, I, I felt that we, you know, we weren't really moderated in the the social aspect of it, and so, you know, the sessions that I attended didn't work out quite as well. What would you do differently, Dustin, next next time? Sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And, and I think there's a lot that we learned uh, through the process of hosting this first virtual event. Um, I would say I, I agree with you. I think there's a couple, you know, key things that I would really focus on for a, a future virtual event, uh, one of which being that networking piece for sure. Um, you know, it, it's, it was it's clear from the feedback that we received in our post event survey. And it's clear just in speaking to people that that's something that that our delegates, our, our exhibitors, they really crave is, is that networking piece. 
Um, so this last year, we we attempted to host a you know a virtual code break and and some kind of virtual lock room things. Um, didn't really get a lot of uptake on that. Uh, I suspect it's probably because it's it's a long day already. So mm -hmm. when you host these these subsequent networking events, people are already kind of uh, tired. Um, you know, they've been looking at their screen for perhaps you know six hours. Uh, so so they didn't really take off. Um, we had a few networking halls that were just Zoom calls, just kind of like this, where, where people could all kind of go in and, and have a conversation. But through this platform, I found that, you know, you either have one person carrying the whole conversation uh, and then the others are kind of just bystanders. Um, so it's kind of tough in that regard. Um, the networking part within the platform itself, I think I would have explained better. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. There was, you know, five different uh, group rooms where people could go after a after a session and debrief and, and have a larger conversation about what they just heard. Uh, I don't know that that was utilized to the fullest extent. And I think, you know, if, if we were to do it again, we'd really promote that uh, better. And maybe, you know, instead of calling it breakout room one, you, you call it uh, induced seismicity uh, follow-up session or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So you get some more people going into that. Uh, so I, I completely agree. I think the networking piece is, is very, very difficult uh, to replicate in a virtual event. Um, but there's things that we can do and there's things that we learned. And there's, if we are to host a virtual event again, there's things that we'll uh, improve upon. That's true. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it made me think of, of those breakout rooms and just playing to that strength of the technical depth uh, that you have in that birds of a feather stick together. And I think of those conferences and I look at those round tables whether it's where you're eating or wherever, where people sit around yeah. and they see each other. And that comes back to social group size. Yeah, like four is our ideal. This is the ideal human social group. Eight, that's interesting because you can break into two groups of four and you can yeah. kind of control it. And beyond that, there are you know, different break points on how you structure things from seminar to lecture. So it'd be really compelling to see if we can break people into, so we're advanced seismic analysis and interpretation of UI Pro software. So if we were thinking of the seismic space, a rock physics table, you know, mm -hmm. a ABO table, a, I have trouble with uh, a complex lithology and I'm trying to map pore pressure, something along those lines where people with those problems sit together in those little think tanks, come up with a discussion and present back in. That's a great idea. Uh, I think something like that may be able yeah, to I like that too. board off into uh, off of the excellence we already have too. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know. You know, I mean, the truth of the matter is that you know today a lot of the social fabric of business has fundamentally changed, and uh, you know when you spend time you know with colleagues or you know customers and vendors and you know it's that the, the fostering of those business relationships has fundamentally changed, and we have to find ways to do it in different in in, in different forms. And you know uh, the, the the social fabric of an event at the end of the day in the convention. I mean, truthfully, it's 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 it's, it's drinking on your own at home, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty sad. So um, yeah, I I, I think uh, uh, you know over the coming year, I think that uh, the, I know we'll all be putting our heads to it. So I think there'll be some other ideas that pop up, and I I'm looking forward to some creative uh, creative ideas. Kirk, I know you had a couple more questions. Do you want to share those with us? Well, I've got a hot burning one, which is how did you do on the international? Because I was uh, chatting with folks in Nigeria that were excited to attend that all on, um, I think three or four continents that we were chatting with that, uh, that thought Geocon was the right pick for them this year. Uh, did you get the data back yet to see if there was any increase there? Uh, what uh, other bonuses did you gain from that virtual conference? Yeah, that's a really good uh, question. I, I, in fact, yeah, I had similar conversations with folks during the, the networking evenings. Uh, one fellow from uh, Belgium and a, a nice young lady from Egypt, and they both commented that they would not otherwise have been able to attend Geo Convention okay. if, if, you know, it, unless it was hosted virtually. Um, overall, the on an average year, Geo Convention will see about 10% of our attendee population from outside of Canada. Uh, this year, we had 20%. Wow. From outside of Canada. Wow. So, uh, so a significant increase uh, percentage wise of, yeah, of folks that were able to attend that probably wouldn't have otherwise been able to, to join us. Uh, so that was really, really cool. Um, yeah, some really good, you know, takeaways, you know, people are really excited, I think now about making Geo Convention bigger and broader and 
and you know we have our baseline now and and how do we grow it geographically uh how do we grow the content side because uh, now we have the tools available to us and we've learned a lot of how to apply those tools so yeah pretty pretty excited at those results for sure so so the experience that the the committee the committee has with this now you know i think that's valuable experience that you could share with similar organizations like ours um, around the world where you know you can collaborate with other societies around the world and invite them you know more effectively than we've been able to do in the past and i'm thinking mm -hmm. i'm hopeful for next year that um, you know the the society will reach out to similar um, sort of organizations around the globe to attract you know more people to come to our conventions and the reverse is also true you know does the opportunity now for me to attend the eag wherever it is in europe this come you know um, next year then yeah all of a sudden that 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 becomes a lot more approachable um, and uh, I think that's extraordinarily exciting. I also think that there may be a role for either provincial or federal government to support from some of the trade offices to help with the society there too, to open some of those doors in other jurisdictions so we can get more traction for people come come to our convention. Yes. Denise, um, did you have another uh, question? I, I do have a question. So overall, was attendance or, or people that uh, said they were going to attend was it up or down compared to last year? And what about your uh, your exhibitors? You know, did you get a good response from that? Yeah, so um, I'll take the first question first. Uh, the attendance year over year was, was down, um, but the biggest decrease that we saw was in, you know, when we have a live event, we had give away the free exhibit floor only passes. And we did that again this year. Exhibitors had the opportunity to distribute free passes, um, but the uptake wasn't nearly as much as we do or had for a, a live conference. You know, live conference, uh, there's coffee on the floor, there's food, you know, it really attracts people to come down to the convention center. And that was our biggest drop by far. Um, and that kind of is what brought all of our numbers down. Right. The, uh, the delegate count was, was relatively flat. Um, or comparatively flat anyway. So, so that was encouraging. People still came for the technical content, um, but yeah, we just did not see the attendance uh, on the, you know, from the free passes. Anyway. Right. Um, the exhibitor side, yeah, we are, are quite fortunate to have a, uh, an understanding group uh, who has been with us for a very long time. They kind of, they, they rolled with everything as it was thrown at them. Uh, they embraced the opportunity to present virtually. You know, you saw a lot of animated banners, you saw videos going on. Uh, a lot of uh, companies had the, the join live function. Uh, so you can kind of click on that to see somebody in real time and, and ask some questions or have conversation that way. So I, I would say, you know, on the exhibitor side, there's a lot again that we could do there to improve the experience, but for the most part, I would say that the exhibitors were, were very understanding of, of the new times and, and kind of rolling with, uh, with the virtual platform and embracing the opportunities that it provided. Um, so I would, yeah, I would just, yeah, I would overall just say thank you to the exhibitors for, for sticking with us and, and being you know, so diligent in, in providing good content for the conference. Uh, it's definitely the way, you know, from, a, from an exhibitor's perspective, it's definitely the way forward. And I think that, you know, we can, we can, we actually end up doing more and having a greater presence, I think, even though that we're not, you know, in a physical, in a physical sense. So I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, let, let's uh, do one more question each and then we'll wrap this up to just, I don't want it to go too long. And it's, uh, it's so, um, Kirk, can we go back to you? I know you've got some more stuff you wanted to share. Well, I thought it may, if this is one of the last ones, I'm going to talk about the future. Next year, if we are in a booth and somebody joins live, are they going to be <coughs> in a booth on a screen? Because it'll be a hybrid of the, yeah. just as now I've, I've learned the blending of the physical to the virtual. I pulled out my, my physical banner for the virtual experience. Yeah. <laughs> so how does that blend next year yeah. is a wild, wildly exciting opportunity, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, we, we talk about the, the doors that a virtual event has opened for us, and we certainly don't want to take that away. We don't want to necessarily go back to the way things always had been because we've learned a lot and, and we've expanded our presence. Um, what a hybrid event looks like is, is very exciting uh, to me as well. I think on the, on the content side, certainly you can have a in-person conference, but maybe you're recording the content as you go and then you host yep. it for some on-demand access later on, uh, or right after the event rather, where people from all over the world can still dial in. Uh, yeah. Maybe you have the live event happening at the same time as the virtual event is happening. 
such that everyone's kind of connected in real time. Um, so there, there's so many cool opportunities that exist uh, in, in blending the two that I think that we need to take advantage of. That, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. We've talked about having a live podcast at our physical booth before this change happened. Mm -hmm. And I could see, you know, that manifesting itself that you could do, we could, you, you could do a version of this, you know, uh, in your booth and broadcast it, broadcast it live. I think there's a whole world of, of new ideas that we can bring to the table and uh, do it differently. I think that's extraordinarily exciting. Yes. Yeah. Denise. I do have one more question. Have you given any thought, Dustin? So you have this program and you, you have presenters who've agreed to have this uh, on-demand presentations for the participants up until the end of October. Did you ever think of promoting it, say uh, one or two day or however many days to people who didn't uh, originally uh, weren't able to sign up for the conference, but that they could pay and, and come to the the talks that are on demand for a couple of days. Did that ever, uh, is that something you would consider? Sure, yeah, I think that's a, a perfect plug for the fact that we do have uh, on-demand access uh, registration available. Um, so, it, you know, anyone who wasn't able to check out the live content uh, was able to purchase a, a pass to go check out all the content that's, that's on demand. So, yeah, one of the beauties with, with having it in this format and having the content on demand is is yeah not only do you just target that live audience during those three days of live event but now you have an additional group that that couldn't attend the three days but can still attend on the on demand so is is that something that is available right now i wasn't aware of that it is yeah um it sure is uh, just on our website uh, there's a link to sign up it's yeah it's it's available for anyone who wasn't able to do the live show oh that's excellent okay fantastic perfect yeah, perfect. It's perfect plug. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, listen. Why don't we uh, Why don't we wrap this up for now? And uh, um, thank you, Dustin, for allowing us to pepper you with questions and being brave enough. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> and uh, Kirk and Denise, thank you so much for your time today. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, do this again. And uh, let's see where it takes us. Okay. Sounds really thank good. You, thank Dustin. you for the opportunity. Everybody stay safe. Thank you. Bye bye.